Okay, Herx away. Okay, Herx released. Copy. Clear front. Copy. My theory that if it's always thrusting that way on launch, it's always thrusting that way on recovery. It's not just imagination or coincidence. <laughs> Okay, Hurricane Atlantic clear of Nautilus. Copy that. Did you zero wraps or is it already zeroed? Uh, it's already zeroed. Huh. Makes me suspicious. You got all your stuff turned on? Yeah. We got a DC ground fault on Argus. Atalanta, slash Atalanta. <laughs> Hard ground. Okay. Can we go all stop? Deck fan, all stop. All stop. Okay. Let's. Yeah. Deck fan, we're investigating an Argus uh, ground fault. Roger. Recommend we proceed to 50 meters to investigate said ground fault. I'm doing it. I'm just going to do it. Here. Dan's asking to proceed to 50. If five zero meters. If you wanna. Okay. Deck fan, okay to proceed to five zero meters. Roger. It's a hard ground fault. And it hasn't cleared yet. AC or DC, Sam? DC. DC. 
Roger. What? I can't hear you. I can hear you directly. I can't hear you. It's uh, Argus Sonar. Argus Sonar? Atalanta. Atalanta Sonar. Uh, yeah. It's not Oregon. What is that? Message say. It says you've been turned off. <laughs> <laughs> sure does. Sit. <laughs> Deck van. Yeah, the uh, ground is on the uh, Atalanta Mesotech. Roger. It'll go away. Yeah, it's a, actually a zero. Roger. Is that a proceed? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Rich. Uh, okay, to hold position, Bridge. Control van winch, all stop five zero, ready for control. Copy that, five zero, taking it from here. You got it, man. <laughs> He's chipper as Yeah, he sure is. <laughs> I think he's glad that he's not doubling up on his watch. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can go. How, how deep are we going? 14, uh, 52. <laughs> <laughs> Chipper this morning. <laughs> all good except for that. That's all except good for except that. for that. Yeah. Audio slate. Audio slate for dive hotel one nine six four at UTC time eighteen eighteen zero zero. Don't monkey with the connection. Mark. <laughs> Melts off. <laughs> and it hides all the other ground faults because we don't have a nice ground fault system. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, he's fine. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> also scared because I didn't drink. Uh, scare me. Yeah. Now you saw there at 13, it was a good thing there. Yeah, I saw one of them come from the side. Yeah. Literally 5,600. <coughs>
What's 5600? Who? 1400 depth. Yeah. 5600 tension. Ah, better. So does it have the same uh, latency as the one the camera that's in the shop there? Yeah, now it's worse because we're feeding it from an Yeah, we're good. Okay. Let's get started. Yeah. All right, a very good morning, 8 to 12. How's everybody feeling? So good. So good. Woo Great. <laughs> Front row is a little bit busy. Better the other salvo. Other salvo. Back row just waiting to Back row is get waiting. to the bottom. I got no lights on. Okay, it's so dark down here. <laughs> oh, wait. You know what? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. All right, front row, everyone. How's everybody feeling? <laughs> no. Hi, Samantha We're with here. Snack. Feel great. <laughs> Hi, Robert Just Waters. In. Uh, ready to explore. Checking in, checking in. I'm Mike Burns. We're here. We're also, um, uh, he prefers Jer Jersey Mike, we heard yesterday. Jersey oh Mike. God, get out of here. <laughs> Jersey Mike. Hey, Just Jersey give the people Mike. what they want. Hey. Hey. Uh, joining us as well, Chad, we have Kevin and Pablo. Hey. Can you guys Let's hear us go. over there? I can hear you just fine. Okay. Yeah, and, and me too. And I think my mic finally works today. So. Oh, no, you know. we gave him the wrong headset. <laughs> <laughs> so just in time for our last dive. So really exciting. <laughs> just just today. This is exciting. Okay, chat. A very Try good morning from the Central Pacific back, Ocean. Um, I hope y'all are having a good time or a good day, good night, good afternoon from wherever you you're go. tuning Either in. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, 8 to 12. Um, why don't we get started with some introductions and a follow-up question. Okay. And I looked this up on Google oh. um, <laughs> oh, <no>. so introductions <laughs> and um, if you were to win the Powerball lottery what would you do with your earnings or with your winnings and I looked it up online and it was about a record-breaking two billion dollars oh, oh no. wow. yeah well I'm sure we've all fantasized about what we would do with that Kind of money. All right. So, hey, I'm Adam Sewell. I'm a uh, watch lead for 8 to 12. I'm a professor at University of Rhode Island, and my research is submarine volcanism. Um, and if I won two, what, two billion dollars? Jesus criminy. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I'd share it with my friends and my family. Um, they'd each get, f well, I'm at least like a thousand dollars each. Would I be the kind of person who's like, I just continue working? No, probably not. <laughs> 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 Might buy a, buy myself a nice uh, little submarine and go do some exploring. Uh, who knows? And of course, I give give a give a lot to charity because i know annie so annie is always <laughs> the one who comes in like i cure world oh my gosh and then i'm like oh <laughs> damn i didn't say the right thing <laughs> all right paula what would you do okay well hi everyone my name is paula santiago i am this watch data logger and this is finishing science intern i am a marine biologist from puerto rico <laughs> over at sociedad Min de marino and we that that is a lot of money um First, yeah, I would share it with my family and friends, pay off everyone's debts, we're all debt free, and then I would buy a boat and people to maintain that boat, so I don't have to maintain it, it doesn't become my full-time job. Mm -hmm. And then I would leave with that boat. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, donate 
most of it, I guess. Now you said, I just want you the said boat. a boat. I want a boat. Could you classify this boat as maybe a yacht? Does it have a swimming pool on it? I actually want a sailing boat. A sailing boat, okay. Maybe the sailing boat, when you're not using it, is towed behind your yacht. Okay, I like that, Jess. Okay. I like that. <laughs> Jess, that sounds lovely. Okay, well, Jules, the question is, if you were to win the lottery, the Powerball lottery, uh, what would you do? And I looked it up, the the lottery, the last winner won $2 billion. $2 billion. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Jules. I work at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, I am a scientist. Harvard on the College? 8 to 12. Is that... <laughs> what is that? Is that a... It's a little school, a small <laughs> liberal arts college. You might not have heard of it. It's okay. Um, I am a marine biologist, and what would I do with $2 billion? I don't know. I feel like I would hire someone to tell me what to do with it, <laughs> like a financial advisor. Smart. And then... I would like buy like a animal shelter or something, Ooh. and um, a lot of snacks. So many snacks. Like <laughs> so really many great snacks. snacks. Like a, a lifetime of snacks. A Scrooge McDuck pool of snacks that you can just dive yeah. into. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would do. Awesome. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Annie Halleck. On good morning, um, in my language is Talofa and Tayamunwia to everybody. Um, I am from Pangapango, American Samoa. Um, I am a local educator back home teaching uh, marine science and biology at our local high school, Samoana, home of the Mighty Sharks. Um, this is my first year sailing with the Nautilus. Uh, if I were to win the lottery, I would, yeah, first off, pay off my family's debt. Um, take care of my family and then also donate to our schools back home because we do need a lot of our high schools and elementary schools need um, funding for projects and just for uh, upgrades in the classrooms make sure our students are taken care of and then um, put it in a trust for my future um, family you know put it oh, in a trust nice. definitely that's yeah, what I would do nice Vast collection of beans. <laughs> and then we'll <laughs> all the beans. <laughs> we'll we have our front row, and we then we got more back row. We can yeah, do. Yeah, back, back row. row. Okay. All right, so uh, I am Pablo Sobron. Uh, I'm a scientist at the SETI Institute, uh, where we're looking for origin and evolution of life in the solar system and beyond. And I'm also the founder of a startup uh, called Impossible Sensing, which is helping. SETI and NASA and others to do that faster and, and more effectively than we could do it before from the private sector. So, and since, you know, any Jules, Adam and Paula have already saved the world with their, <laughs> with their money, <laughs> and because today is uh, World Ocean Day, uh, I feel inspired, and I would uh, put all that money into an investment vehicle, uh, and I would just uh, dish out money to smart, uh, young entrepreneurs trying to come up with new ways to make the ocean uh, the blue sustainable economic engine we all want to uh, have in our lives. So I will become an investor, let's put it that way. Uh, awesome. An angel okay. investor. I am Kevin Zach from the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab, and I'm a senior electrical engineer. Oh, um, Huskies. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> uh, If dogs. I had $2 billion, I'd probably start a research lab and oh, okay. uh, to explore different ideas and also start a uh, uh, scholarship at the Santa Rosa Junior College because I was lucky enough to be a, a recipient uh, of the Dole Scholarship. Uh, that really helped me on my track and I'd like to give back to that. Oh, that's nice. All right, thank you. And then we have our awesome front row. When you're ready. <laughs> Are we pointing <laughs> fingers? And <laughs> yeah, we know, know it's good, Dave. We're looking around. We're looking around to find the uh, awesome. Uh, 
the front row, but you'll have to do with <laughs> us instead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Dave Robertson, um, lead video engineer here, originally from Seattle, Washington. Go Dogs, a Huskies mm -hmm. fan, used to work at the University of Washington. And I'm sitting in the video seat today. What would I do with $2 billion? Well, the usual, everybody's mentioned, pay off all the debts and take care of the kids and the family and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and then buy a Disney Vacations Club membership and live at all the Disney parks. <laughs> sequentially, <Yes. laughs> sequentially around the world, all the Disney parks, live there for a couple of months at a time all the way around the world. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Have you been to ones outside of the U.S.? I have not. I went to, uh, what was it, Japan Disney ones, oh. which is kind of like ocean-themed. Yeah, actually. it is very ocean-themed. Yeah, yeah I've looked cool. at it. Uh, dreamed about it, but uh, haven't been there yet. And uh, then I want to ride in Pablo's uh, research vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a financial vehicle. It was a fine. You want to ride in this? Yeah, financial I, I want to ride in this financial vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to ride along. Well, you know, but maybe we can cut a deal with Kevin here and his research vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a submarine with mine, so we can all go. There you that. go. Nice. Sh shipping up together. Annie, thank you so much for seeding this uh, brainstorming here. <laughs> I can donate the job to. <laughs> yeah, we'll go on Paula's <laughs> boat with my sub. Yeah, and, and I'll get the students involved. Oh my God! I will Let's bring go. dogs. <laughs> we'll bring rescue animals. On <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am Mike Burns. I am the lead deck chief and uh, current uh, Atalanta pilot for the eight to twelve shift. Uh, currently residing. In Glassboro, Glassboro! New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> you even started offering that. No one else is saying it. I know. <laughs> yeah. From uh, from Hawaii originally, but uh, how much money are we getting in this lottery? Two, the last two one was B. two billion. Two billion. Okay. In February. If wow. I had gotten two billion dollars, I mean, I think that's enough to put a down payment on a house. So I probably. Oh yeah. Is, I probably at that point probably buy a house. Even on Oahu. Yeah. Uh, it's questionable. It's questionable. <laughs> that is down payment on a neighborhood. Uh, uh, um, and then with the rest of the money, I would probably either uh, invest in uh, science and technologies and robotics, uh, as well as give some to uh, animal shelters uh, for non-kill shelters out there. Try to adopt out all those Australian cattle dogs. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> uh, I'm Robert Waters. I'm the Hurt Pilot, uh, OET's uh, facilities manager and ROV engineer. I live in LA, and I can't discuss what I would do with the billion, two billion dollars. Go. <laughs> what? Right. What? <laughs> Put it all in his. Lawyer his all in his. You can't talk about it. Hide from people and not let them know I had two billion dollars. <laughs> actually, that's pretty smart. Yeah, Wait, yeah. how do we know he doesn't have two billion dollars? Yeah. He but, wouldn't have told us if he did. Non-answer, answer. No answer. <laughs> doth protest too much. <laughs> Uh, okay, interesting choice. Uh, Samantha Wishnack, navigator on uh, this expedition, also the uh, operations coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust, which operates Nautilus. Uh, I am incredibly impressed by all of your very generous and very practical uh, plans. I, uh, <laughs> on the opposite <laughs> spectrum, I would be getting a tall ship or a historic steamship and running it as a performing arts theater art boat, sailing all over the place. <laughs> oh wow, that's, oh, that's cool. awesome. Ooh. All right, thank you so Wait, much. Why don't you offer oh, free oh tickets for everyone to I'll come? Offer, I mean, of course. Well, yeah, the, yeah, there you go. Free? And now, oh, it's, okay. now it's supporting exactly. the arts. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that would be ideal. It would be a like nonprofit that is you know funded <laughs> by this wonderful uh, lotto. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I would get the boat for free, so there's no uh, initial. You get the boat for free? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, donated boat. Oh, donated. There's boat, a couple yeah. of boats I've, I've seen over the years that, you know, are like going for a dollar because they're Oh, you got to put a lot of work into them. You got to put a lot of work in them, but yeah. you do it free, you get 
labor for free in a boatyard if you got connections. Right, right. You also have $2 billion, so oh, you probably so don't have to worry dollars. about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's $2 billion connections, right? I think yeah. <laughs> with two Bs, you can get a fleet of those things. Yeah, right. Yeah, they're expensive go. to run, though, so. And I want to, you know, do free tickets, so. We'll see. I was recently reminded of my high school senior superlative that made it in the yearbook, which was most likely to sell all of her worldly possessions and buy a pirate ship. <laughs> what? <laughs> which what? apparently has not changed in the last <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> all righty. Uh, thank you so much, team. And for our folks online, um, we are currently uh, descending to explore a feature on the summit of Gio 10. Our expected dive duration on is about eight hours with a max depth of 1467 meters. Chat, please, if you have any questions, uh, we have our awesome team here in the control van um, that are willing to answer them for you. So... And we should let people know this is a uh, uh, laser spectrometer yes, dive. It's yes. on a vehicle. We're going to be doing more uh, kind of exploration with that laser spectrometer. Maybe Pablo and Kevin want to give a little rundown of what it is and how it works? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Adam, for the segue into this. Uh, so, yeah, so this is the the final uh, uh, dive for our laser technology. And so, uh, I'll, you know, I'm sure some of you have been listening to us for the last few weeks, but I'm sure there is new folks today, given that special day as well. So uh, what we did is, over the last five years, uh, We've been working uh, with uh, NASA and, and a lot of universities, researchers, uh, and, and other centers around the world to put together a, a, a box, if you want, that would shoot a laser at a distance so that we could interrogate, uh, we could explore, analyze the seafloor uh, as the vehicle uh, is moving. So uh, you'll see that in, in about I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe uh, one hour, as we hit the bottom. Essentially, what we have done is to uh, build a small lab that is similar to what you've seen in, in school, right? Uh, where you, you shoot a laser or you have cameras and you probe a sample, a uh, rock or liquid, and you get the composition of this uh, material uh, in your screen, and then you can write a paper, right? So, so for us, uh, this expedition, uh, thanks to Adam and his team at, at NOAA uh, Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, uh, we, we were able to join uh, Nautilus uh, in this uh, first uh, cruise of the, of the season to really show that it worked. Uh, that was for us the, the first uh, step into the journey. Uh, it's the first time this instrument goes into the ocean. And uh, what we wanted to try is to see if we could measure water, obviously, right? So uh, if we go down there, shoot the laser, and we don't get water signal, then uh, we call Houston. Houston, Houston, we had a problem here. Um, but uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. So at the first dive, uh, we shoot the laser. Everything fired. We could see it in the screen. I think you could see it too in your screen, uh, since we were uh, uh, live streaming our, our own cameras uh, to the world. And we could get measurements of, uh, of the water. Uh, not only water, but we also start seeing uh, sulfate, uh, which is a molecule that is uh, present in all the ocean water. And we start seeing salt, which if you have ever swam in the ocean, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, salt uh, uh, is, uh, is pretty abundant in, in our ocean. And we can also see it with our instrument. So um, that was the cursory checks that everything works. Uh, by shining our light into water, um, the water will reflect and will emit some of that light back to us. And that light will be uh, a way to fingerprint the chemical composition of that water. So that che that box was checked uh, within essentially 20 minutes of diving. So, so to all effects, our mission was accomplished um, uh, very quickly. And, and I think now you can see in sat feed uh, number three in the screen, uh, uh, you can see from the top there is a lightsaber. Uh, or a laser, uh, uh, in this case, a scientific laser that is uh, pointing towards the middle of the screen. So that is our own camera that is attached uh, next to our laser uh, window. Uh, and we can see how the laser is shooting probably about 10 meters uh, at this point. We can see it going down into the water. And this is uh, the very first time a uh, active remote uh, chemical sensor is being deployed uh, subsea. 
Uh, so uh, you can imagine the excitement of our team after years uh, of struggle to build it, after pandemic delays and, and other traumas, uh, we were able finally to, to test it here. So uh, then over the same dive, first dive, and over the next three or four dives that we got a chance to go into, um, we of course kept shooting at the water, learning new things about uh, the organic matter in the water. So. You see here in the cameras uh, little white speckles, look like stars uh, uh, there. So that's uh, it's called marine snow, um, and it's called that because it effectively is a combination of uh, clusters or little uh, nuggets of uh, of organic matter, uh, dead uh, algae, uh, dead fish, uh, fish number twos and number ones, and more things. <laughs> and, Red and, fish, fish. <laughs> and and all of this. Uh, Eventually, uh, it's heavier than water, so it will slowly rain down, snow down into the seafloor. And this is important uh, for us to measure because uh, by looking at the flux and the amount of this uh, organic matter that is raining down, we can quantify how much carbon uh, the ocean is taking out of the atmosphere and is transforming into organic matter that will precipitate down and will stay in the seafloor uh, for hundreds, thousands of years, if no more. And this is a very effective way for the ocean to, to be in a carbon sink as we're trying to, to ramp up uh, the amount of atmospheric CO2 drawdown uh, capture that we do in the ocean. So that was the third uh, discovery uh, or verification that we could do with our instrument is that we can effectively see how this uh, amount of carbon changes uh, over time, uh, which for us means over depth. Uh, so uh, the, the lower we go, uh, the the lower organic matter that we have, um, there's more on the surface where more life exists, right? So it's uh, it's intuitive to understand it that way. And we can verify that with our instrument, and this is why you can see in the laser, uh, it looks green on the top of the screen, uh, but it starts turning blue and purple as it goes towards the center of the screen, meaning as it's going far away from us. So uh, and this is uh, expected if you had a lot of organic matter in the water because uh, the laser is the most powerful very close to the window which for us uh, for you in uh, back home is uh, towards the top of the screen that is where most of the light uh, 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 it's visible uh, because as you will know uh, water absorbs light right so that's why you can only see this far in the in the water so uh, so uh, as we as the laser travels away from our window uh, we start seeing less and less of the laser, and you start seeing more and more of the fluorescence of this emission that is coming out from the organic matter coming back to us. So there is a transition point there that you can see the green turns purple or blue. That we calculate is about two, two and a half meters from our window, and this is where, where the intensity of the laser, uh, remember when it's most intense next to the window, decays and goes down low enough to enable this fluorescence, which is less intense, to be more visible. So that's what you see this uh, beautiful, almost artistic uh, color gradient uh, of the laser as you travel deep into the into the water. So this is what we're seeing here right now. And uh, maybe to avoid boring everybody, uh, I will stop this here. And Annie, I will be happy to, as we hit bottom, right? I can uh, retake the story and, and explain how we explore the bottom and what we can see there and, and not, and the plan for the for the next few hours. Yeah, thank you so much. So we do have viewers uh, tuning in, but before we get to answer any questions, so this is just amazing technology. Um, what inspired you and your team to just really see this through? So uh, oddly enough, uh, this whole story started on Mars. Uh, and uh, yes, Mars, uh, where we do not have oceans of water today, but we did uh, a few billion years ago. So. Uh, as we explored Mars over the last uh, 20 years with uh, spirit, opportunity, uh, sorry, spirit and uh, opportunity yeah, on the, in the early 2000s, then with curiosity, which is still running after 11 years, and now with perseverance and, and ingenuity, the helicopter, uh, after, you know, over the last two years, we've been really, really uh, discovering that uh, these oceans on Mars were more widespread than we thought. So there were lakes, there were rivers, there were seas uh, covering the planet because it has an atmosphere, right, back in the day. So uh, also we know that this water changed in chemistry. So depending where you are on Mars, you were in a former lake or, or sea or river that had specific conditions. So the more we learn about Mars, the more we realize that it really is an ocean world, uh, ancient ocean world. 
but what makes it even more interesting is that at the same time we were discovering these uh, ancient oceans on Mars, we uh, figured out that uh, the moons of Jupiter uh, and Saturn uh, are indeed uh, current ocean worlds in that they contain liquid oceans, uh, salty as our ocean, today. So these are not ancient oceans, but they are today oceans. And uh, the only challenge is that they are sealed, they are trapped under a thick crust of ice. Uh, right. That is why they're still liquid, right? So you put ice lid on things, uh, and you know, no matter how much the pressure in, uh, the pressure uh, cooks up inside, uh, you still have a liquid thing. Now, in Enceladus in particular, and if you have uh, been listening to the news of uh, James Webb uh, this week, uh, Enceladus, uh, it is a pressure cooker uh, on its own, and it is so close to Saturn that the tidal forces, remember the tide, tides here on Earth, right? So when your, your sea level raises, you know, anywhere from one meter to 10 meters, depending on where you are. Uh, so on Enceladus, uh, uh, instead of having the moon pulling your water, it is the massive Saturn pulling the water there. So the tidal forces, the pull of that water uh, makes it uh, uh, essentially scratch against the bottom, the rocky bottom, and that creates heat, heat creates pressure, and eventually, if you have cooked ever uh, something in a pressure cooker, that pressure needs to go somewhere, right? So in Enceladus, the case happens where the, that pressure breaks the ice, and you have jets of ocean uh, coming out into space. We've seen this already. In fact, we have sampled that with Cassini uh, almost 15, 20 years ago, and we measured the chemistry of this ocean, which, of course, as soon as it hit the space became ice, but still is water. Uh, we were able to analyze that and found uh, chemicals uh, like methanol, uh, uh, some silicates as well, uh, amino acids. Uh, essentially, we're seeing uh, what we think are the building blocks of life. These wow. uh, components that, when put together at the right time in the right place, may, uh, without likelihood, uh, generate metabolism, uh, generate life. And uh, this really changed paradigm uh, in, in NASA and other agencies, uh, especially ESA in Europe, in that, uh, of course, Mars is still our prime uh, destination to look for life 2.0, because Mars is next to us. It's only a six months trip, uh, if you're lucky. And, uh, and you know, we know how to, how to land on Mars. We've been do done it for 50 years since the Viking missions in the 70s. And we really have an understanding of that. In fact, we're bringing samples from Mars uh, in a few years after the mission of Perseverance is concluded. But uh, back to the to the other moons, which are much further away, right? So you're talking about five years journeys to Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, so we don't know those things very well, but uh, since we were able to capture and analyze these oceans, we realized that these seas in uh, Enceladus and potentially on Europa, which is the Jupiter moon, much bigger, uh, potentially these oceans do have the same features that we have on our own oceans on Earth. Uh, these hydrothermal chimneys, these old volcanoes, if you want, this activity that today is bringing out uh, very rich fluids uh, full of nutrients and energy into a cold ocean that is essentially empty of everything except salt. And this is where uh, we think uh, on Earth life started because this gradient, this huge disruption in temperature, uh, energy, chemicals that happens between the chimneys, the inside and the outside, is where really life likes to play. Uh, it thrives in this environment. So uh, assuming life started there on Earth, uh, at any rate, we know that life likes it there because these chimneys today on Earth are full of life. So anyway, life likes that. So we're using that as a proxy to a future exploration of these ocean worlds uh, uh, with these missions to find life 2.0 there in these chimneys. Which uh, brings me back to today. Uh, so, uh, so through this journey, which uh, I shrink it to five minutes, but it's really uh, 20 years uh, for me, particularly personally. Uh, I started to realize that uh, to really explore this, this, this potential life harbors uh, in alien oceans, uh, Mars or ocean worlds uh, as well, we really had to develop new technology. Uh, the tools we had, uh, cameras, uh, sampling devices, uh, massive laboratories, while they're very good and informative, uh, you can just fly those things uh, easily. They're not very uh, friendly to, to space flight. So we need to come up with new ideas. And that was kind of the path of my career is to how do we do more with less? How do we shrink laboratories to bring them to the field? How do we give scientists the information they need to uh, verify or nullify hypotheses about the uh, origin of life? So pandemic in particular was a blessing in disguise, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and 
you know, I'm not going to minimize the trauma and suffering that that caused uh, across the world. Uh, it did for me too, as well, personally. But uh, professionally, it gave us a chance to take a step back. And uh, since we were delayed and people couldn't go to the lab and work and develop new things, we got a chance to talk to folks like Adam here, uh, uh, Leo uh, Macelloni at the University of Southern Mississippi, government agencies, and start to realize that, you know, the same needs and the same uh, techni technologies we're building for space could really be used on our own oceans, of which we knew very little. Uh, right. This is, the, this is the reason for being of the Ocean Exploration Trust, is to explore the ocean better so we can make decisions that are smarter, right, about our ocean, uh, and as fast as we can as we try to decarbonize and electrify the economy. So I think the, the idea here is that uh, we, find, we found a synergy between the needs and the technology we're using in space, or we will use in space, and applications for scientific discovery uh, on board this expedition, uh, together with Adam's uh, team uh, uh, back in back home. Uh, so that kind of uh, made it clear that you know we should bring this technology to this expedition way before we send it to anywhere else, uh, which uh, of course you know makes sense, right? It's way cheaper to test things in on Earth uh, than it is in space. But um, that really was the connector: is that you know, hey, NASA is spending a lot of effort into developing ocean tech for other planets. Uh, what about our own planet? Uh, let's not forget right. about it. And I think that's Adam's brilliance to really uh, put together that and, and figure out a way to bring us uh, here this uh, this expedition. So we're really thankful, Adam and team, to for the chance to really not just test the technology. Like I said earlier, we, we don't just verify that flip the switch and everything is working. We indeed uh, are deriving new science. Uh, not new in the sense that we're not discovering anything undiscovered, we are now verifying that our tool can deliver scientific information that the scientists on board here, uh, Young and Les Young, uh, and the scientists back home on shore can actually start using to, to again, uh, describe the environment we're exploring here in a much uh, greater detail, given that the amount of data we can get here is orders of magnitude more and cheaper to get than the traditional way of picking a sample, and you'll see this uh, over the course of the dive today, how how difficult, although the pilots here are spectacularly skilled and good, still is pretty challenging and, and hard to grab a rock, put it in a basket, bring it up here, and then uh, if you have videos of Adam uh, and Tim cutting the rocks, uh, making a mess up there on the deck, and then, you know, <laughs> label everything. Our eyes are kind of now tuned in to exactly what they look like as right. we drive around. Everyone's right. kind of scanning for them. In fact, last night we saw, saw a cloud shaped like a beaked whale. <laughs> <laughs> bone. Um, and so those we've, uh, you know, kind of made an initial cursory confirmation that they are our bones. Um, they're covered with the a coating of the iron manganese crust, which means that they've been sitting on the seafloor for quite a while. Um, we don't have any sort of estimate of, of the age, but uh, there are perhaps methods we could use for that. And then we also found on this a, a more recent um, marine mammal or, well, I don't think we even know what, what it is because it's just a skull fragment. Um, but found uh, a recent fall, and we knew it, re it was recent because it still had the types of uh, worms that we see eating bones on modern whale falls, Ossidex worms. Um, these, as far as we know, are uh, the kind of furthest west um, occurrence of these, these worms that have been observed or sampled and so a, a bit of a range extension uh, for those and so can't really say at this point what what the skull fragment was from but uh, but it was really exciting find thank you um, well oh, oh, sorry, sorry. and so on that note um, I'm back to the laser spectrometer our a geologist is tuning in um, and, is, and is asking, maybe this is for um, a future, um, is there an equivalent portable laser spectrometer that geoscientists can carry into the field on land? 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, part of the inspiration to build the instrument that we have today for Deep Sea came from uh, my my current work on Mars. So if you look at Perseverance um, uh, suite of instruments, one of them is called SuperCam. And SuperCam is really the Swiss army knife of geosciences for Mars uh, because what it can do is shoot the laser uh, at a distance uh, on Mars because there's no atmosphere. It's about 10 meters distance. Um, uh, so this laser shoots and it does three things. It looks at the elemental makeup of the rock. Uh, it looks at the mineral makeup of the rock. And uh, if we're lucky one day, it will look at the organic makeup of a rock from former uh, potential uh, life uh, forms. So uh, we're doing geochemistry with a tool very similar to the one we have here on Mars. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, uh, practically, of course, the instrument is on Mars, so you cannot use it on Earth. But uh, in our in our uh, company at Impossible Sensing, um, we have built a dry uh, land version of uh, of this uh, subsea system, which does essentially the same thing, right? So uh, geochemistry, mineralogy, and organic distributions on on land. Uh, so yeah, the answer is yes. This is technology is portable to both dry and wet. And in fact, we started in dry because it was always easier. So, uh, so now it's on Mars, it's in the deep sea, and very soon uh, it can be on the field on Earth here to do uh, geosciences uh, yeah, in the field. Yeah, and there are now uh, portable handheld uh, oh, wow. XRDs, X-ray diffraction systems. Um, they're kind of qualitative. I think what Pablo's talking about is maybe a bit more quantitative. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if, uh, actually, Alan, that's a great, great point. Uh, I think that the very first uh, portable XRD and uh, X-ray diffraction uh, uh, and X-ray fluorescence, which is the traditional way of doing mineralogy in the lab for 100 years plus, uh, the first uh, of those, in fact, was also a NASA invention. Uh, and we flew that on the Curiosity rover. So um, a friend of mine, uh, Philippe Saracin, uh, uh, created a spin-off company out of NASA called Institute uh, that built, commercialized this uh, Mars technology for, for the geosciences on Earth. It was a suitcase, essentially, that you could bring everywhere. And that was about 20 years ago. Uh, then Olympus uh, acquired the company, and now it's selling this uh, to geoscientists all over the world. Uh, and then, yeah, the laser folks, uh, we always fall behind X-ray, because laser was only invented in the 70s, uh, what, 60s, only applied uh, in research in the 70s only used uh, commercially in the 80s, 90s. So we're catching up with uh, X-ray uh, technology. But eventually, yeah, there is a lot of companies now, like uh, BW Tech, um, uh, TSI, uh, I don't know, uh, Ocean, uh, uh, Ocean uh, uh, Inside, uh, that are selling handheld, uh, kind of like a power drill uh, shape uh, systems that we can just press against the rock and get information about the elements and minerals. Uh, Adam is right that the drawback is that these are typically uh, qualitative, so they're very good to survey and flag stuff that is interesting. The next wave and the stuff that we're building and others, of course, uh, we're building is to take that quantitative leap into actually start doing uh, hard uh, numbers and getting real uh, real information uh, on the fly in situ um, uh, before you go to the lab. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, this is uh, another question. Um, I know, well, this is, I think this is along your lines, um, Adam. Um, we have viewers tuning in. Uh, any observation or comments if you have watched the, or our team, if we have kept up with the Kilauea eruption? Yeah, that's very exciting. So um, just for those who aren't aware, uh, Kilauea is the most active volcano on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, it erupted for about 30 years continuously from vents along the East Rift Zone. And then in 2018, had a major eruption uh, at the summit and, and at new vents along the East Rift Zone and then shut off for a few years. And during that pause, Mauna Loa, which is the sec second most active volcano there on the big island, erupted that hadn't happened for um, more than 30 years 
and then just in the past couple days a new eruption started at the summit of Kilauea caldera and and at present that eruption is confined to the summit there there were initial fire fountains that were kind of 200 meters high and then they've been sustained at at kind of 50 meters and I think I read yesterday that there's about 35 feet of new lava has been added to the floor of the of the caldera now there's wow there's uh the caldera is enormous but the the eruption is confined within the active crater within the caldera um they think that it's going to stay up in the caldera area um but you always have to be uh you know aware if it it can you know the the caldera is connected to the rift zones in the subsurface so magma will move up into the caldera region and then flow down either either the east rift zone or the southwest rift zone and potentially produce an eruption there um, uh -huh. the one that in 2018 was cool uh, in part because it produced huge lava flows that reached the ocean so it made new land on the edge of of the island and uh, nautilus was involved in the Ooh survey of where that lava was tumbling into the ocean is one of the first times we've you know been able to document what happens in the shallow subsurface when you have a an eruption that reaches the ocean it was very cool and they even found um some kind of slightly warm water from the cooling of the lava flows so so fluids that were you know a little bit above ambient and microbial mat generation or growth uh so yeah it's super exciting i'm so what's really interesting i was back i was on big island in 2018 and i i mentioned this before um like the lava kind of quote unquote disappeared like everybody was trying to figure out where it went uh -huh. like um is there an explanation for that because i haven't gotten any oh yeah so so I, I don't know the particular instance you're talking about, but the rift zone, uh, the east rift zone where the vents were, um, is essentially there's a big crack in the ground that extends all right. the way out to the to the coastline, and so lava can flow along the surface and then encounter this rift zone crack and dive back in oh, to the rift okay. zone, and then it can flow underground for a bit and maybe pop out somewhere else but you know the other part of lava disappearing is what happens when it gets to the coastline and what we found in that work was that there was more lava deposited in the ocean than was deposited on land and you know as you know terrestrial volcanologists we kind of look at we we have a record of the eruption on land but there's this hidden part of the eruption that's that's underwater so it's kind of cool to see that Thank you, thank you. That that makes total sense for me now, because everyone was just freaking out, but not really giving an explanation <laughs> of what was going on. Okay, in regards to our dive, um, what are we expecting to see? Any sampling goals, objectives? Uh, so we're going to be at the top of, of the seabound, and um, the tops of the seamounts are, are pretty covered with sediment um, partly because they're flat they're a good place to collect sediment um, but this one has a little bit of a, a crack at the top and a little bit of uplifted terrain we've we've seen other spots like this on this expedition and so I expect we're gonna see some small ledges of carbonate rock covered with manganese crust and hopefully a bunch of corals and sponges and other organisms uh, uh, living there. Thank you. Jules, thoughts or comments? Yeah, um, in terms of biology, I mean, we don't really know what we're going to see. So um, I'm hoping for a lot of coral and sponge communities. Uh, sampling goals, we want to sample organisms that are characteristic of this area. So we're looking for patterns in, um, in coral and sponge species, uh, especially. 
And um, it's cool, like, you know, we don't know, we don't know what we're going to see because on different dives, we've seen totally different things. Like right. areas totally That's dominated true. by sponges, totally dominated by corals, different types of corals. It's, it's pretty exciting every time you go down. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So for all of our viewers tuning in, we are currently um, descending to dive um, on a, to explore a feature on the summit of Gio 10 using the laser dive bot. Our expected dive duration is about eight hours with a maximum depth of 1467 meters. Um, if you're just tuning in and have not um, seen our previous dives, don't worry, um, our awesome team uploaded our highlights on nautiluslive.org. So check out our website um, for those amazing highlights. Um, shout out to our friends from all over the world. Um, we have viewers tuning in from all over the United States, Canada, UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, Philippines, Italy, Greece, Finland, Spain, and Australia. Thanks for tuning in as we explore GEO 10 together. Oh, okay. Uh, Adam, could you please explain uh, what, is it breccia? Breccia. Breccia. What is breccia? Yeah, uh, breccia is just a, a term for a rock made up of broken pieces of uh, of the rock. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, where you often find them, or you're, they're often kind of associated with faults, um, where two kind of slabs of rock are moving past one another, and that motion breaks up the rock into smaller pieces. And once that gets cemented together, that rock type is called a breccia but in more general terms it is just a rock made up of broken fragments of, <laughs> of the rock that of sounds rock. like a horrible definition <laughs> that's why we have the term breccia so we don't have to say rock made up of other rock. broken rock <laughs> <laughs> Yay, thank you so much of course shout out to the maldives we can never forget How about you folks thanks for tuning in um for our viewers of you, if you have any questions, uh, send them in the chat. We have our team ready to answer them for you. Um, we should be, what's our ETA? Couple minutes. Thank Couple you, minutes. thank you very much. And Annie, I think you and I have an interaction in 20 minutes, yeah? Yeah, yes, 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 we do. And then the deepest, our deepest dive was about 3,100 meters, chat. It's a little shallower than we anticipated. Is it? A little bit. Not by much. Not by much. Robert, did you experience any of the um, hydraulic oh, pressure drop that? as you Shrimp? tried to go forward? Um, so. Oh yeah, there. You see it? Yeah. You see it bouncing around. It's it maybe is, not as much, huh? Not as much, but it's still definitely there. And if you kind of play with it a bit, you can get it to kind of go away. But it's not a practical method to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am kind of baffled on what's going on there. Huh. Hydraulics is not really my main thing, so. It has to do with a, a valve somewhere that's either sticking or improperly set, or I'm not quite sure. And we no longer use chocolate syrup as a hydraulic fluid. Yeah. That could be the problem? No. We use baby oil. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, without the perfume. <laughs> Chat, That's we'll right. be reaching the bottom in a couple of minutes. Okay. There we go. 
Oh, and yes. Coming up to nice. all bottom. On bottom. Let's go. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I'll stop on the winch. Okay, auto heading coming on. Yeah. Auto heading Spin on. Spin around. Take a gander. Okay. Spinning to you. You want me to come to you? Yeah. Yep. Because we're heading west anyway. Yep. And I'm going to go ahead and try sonar again. Yeah. Okay, Fred, have you already stopped? Sure. Still getting a hard DC. Okay, turning off. Is this dive one nine six four? One nine six four. Yeah, okay. yes, it in. is. <laughs> we have all our lights on, Bob. No. Oh, okay. Closer? Yeah, closer, please. That's not the right one. A little bit closer if you can. I'd like to fill the screen as much as possible. Oh, okay. All right. That'll do it, Bob. Thanks. Okay, black balance first. We're going black. I can't see. Hate it when that happens. <laughs> Open your eyes, Adam. There oh. you are. You yeah, you're back. I have my sight <laughs> back. Coming up. Thank you so much, chat. Happy World Oceans Day. Black balance now. Given uh, Pablo's description, maybe we should change it to World's Ocean Day instead of World Oceans Day. Yes. <laughs> World's Ocean Day. World's, yeah, Day. I agree. World's Ocean Day. Yep. Okay, white black down. So all done. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's actually that way. <laughs> Science, are you good to go? Yep. Great. ROV is good to go. Bridge nav. So, uh, for those of you at home, uh, if you're looking at the feed number two, uh, you're seeing a view of Hercules taken from Atlanta. And, uh, in about five seconds or ten, you're going to be able to see a laser dot uh, right there. Uh, you see a laser dot uh, about five meters below the vehicle. Can you zoom in with Argus yeah. and one Atlanta? One and second. That is how we explore uh, uh, down there. So uh, the laser is fixed, so it's shooting straight down uh, from the vehicle. And we're using the pilot's skills to to raster or to okay. to move around uh, rocks and sediment to Bridge get a 2D Go ahead, uh, yeah. of uh, the okay. chemistry mineralogy of, uh, of the bottom. Uh, right now, we're shooting at sediment, as you can see. 
and sediment is sand essentially uh, so what we've seen is quartz which makes up about almost all of it that is to be in the sand uh, we do see is as we um, as we continue the traverse and uh, we good morning we're we at, at bottom um, if we could start moving three zero meters two six five As we start moving, uh, and you see these uh, black uh, masses there, black spots, uh, those are uh, made of uh, organic matter. And this is where our instrument excels at, uh, at getting these uh, signals that fluoresce uh, when we shine them with the laser here. So through the day, we'll be, we'll be seeing uh, 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 you know, changes. Uh, hopefully, some day or some hour, we'll hit rocks and other more formations. but. For now, we're gonna. Uh, uh, after the checks of the vehicles are complete, we're gonna go down to three meters uh, elevation because three meters is our optimal uh, measurement distance. And from there, we'll start moving around and, and getting the data. And today, we we have a little surprise uh, uh, thanks to Dave, our video uh, guru. Uh, we've been able to engineer a, a view of the screen that Kevin and I are looking at. Uh, which shows the exactly. you have it now That's in, cool, in feed yeah. three. This is going to show uh, occasionally as Dave uh, flips it on and off uh, the data that we get in the in the in our in our instrument. So, so today you can actually see uh, what we're seeing here. Uh, thanks, Dave. This is brilliant. I think we might have passed an unbelievable. I think I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How would it to get the shark too. The shark too. Oh. Possible shark sighting in. Oh no, there it is. Oh, yeah, hey. right there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Same We're one we saw before. Uh, We're talking about the Umbalula, right? Yes. We did see the Umbalula, and then the it shark's is. out there. The we did. Dave, we the what did we say it was? Oh, like the Pacific is running away. Oh, oh, what's this? Dumbo. <gasps> is that a, wait, no way, really? Yeah. Oh, no way, <laughs> what? Dumbo, Dave, what? your dreams come true. Wait, what? A shark and a Dumbo together? Wait, this yeah. is too much wow. for me. It's I don't need the lottery. Happy World Ocean I don't need the Happy World Ocean Day. Oh my God, that's so cute. Maybe we ought to get a zoom on that, that boy. Yeah, zoom in, Dave. Wow, what? That's a gorgeous uh, one. Can we turn yeah. Wow. Lasers? Yeah, turn off the lasers. Wow. wow. Oh my God. Okay. I'm so yep. happy. I'm so, so happy right now. Yep. Look at that Lasers color. Like Samantha, it. your sibling. <laughs> my sibling. <laughs> <laughs> Friend. Little octopus. Oh, little, wow. was it little squid or little octopus? Little, little squid. squid. Little squid. Look at that. Yeah, TT. Just gorgeous. Does Grimpo to this? Look at that. Probably about 40 centimeters. 45. <laughs> oh <my> 45. <laughs> 45. <laughs> what? Oh, backflip. Yeah, he's he's getting some more. Let's go. Come on. Atlanta. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can't control myself. <laughs> Wow. What? That is amazing. Thanks Thanks for, uh, out, Dave. That's amazing. Thanks for saying hello. You can follow it if you want. Yeah. I mean, if you can. Is it a challenge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow challenge it if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, chat. We have been blessed. <laughs> by the by Wow. The This made my day. Me, yeah, yeah <laughs> mine too. The ship wow. move is underway, but it's headed in uh, the right direction. So. Okay, zoom in again, Dave. We're good here. Look at that. It's so beautiful. He's not very big. You can see, or it. This fellow is not very large. <laughs> large enough for us. 
Oh yeah, I like it when they open their tentacles a little bit. Whoop. Really working hard to stay in the water column mm -hmm. with those big fins. Right. Wow. So are those fins like modified uh, tentacles? Oh, I just thought they were modified ears. That's a good point. I don't um, know. I think it still no, has their tentacles. Wow. Yeah, they're more like fins. <laughs> wow. I'm like, I, I feel like I met a celebrity or something. <laughs> Even the ship to shore yeah. connection <laughs> team is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Mesmerized. Nice focus. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot. Except for all that snow. That's Adeline. no, it's That's cool. So That's beautiful. A, this is it actually adds no, to it. Great. Yeah. Nautilus uh, Christmas video. <laughs> <laughs> Octopus in a snow globe. <laughs> Those fins are incredible. Ah, oh, beautiful exit shot. Oh, it's back. Nope. Oh, it's back. <laughs> that was for Jonathan. That was for the edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. That was cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, this is the rest of our dive. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's ascend. <laughs> yeah. It really wants to get away from us. <laughs> yeah, let's let it go. Yeah. Yes, chat, this is a highlight, of course. Okay. Bye, Octopus. Time to continue. Hi. Happy World Ocean Day. Yep. All right. Oh my nice fade to black. That was good. Yes, it's very dramatic. Chad, this is my first. Actually, I would consider this my first stumble octopus. Extends my streak. You always remember your first time yeah. seeing the double octopus. Mm. Okay, that move was uh, 265. 265. It's uh, already oh. over though, so I can put <laughs> another move. We wandered off a bit. Yeah, let's get you lined back up and then I'll put in another move. Okay. okay. I'm okay. Sounds you can, good. You Thank you. Give it a go. That yeah. was. That yeah. was. Look at this flat bottom. Bridge now. Highlight for sure. Oh, let's do five zero meters, two six five. Five zero meters, two six five. Copy, thank you. Yeah. There's another fish. Or is that just some schmutz? Uh, I think it might. Fish Actually, schmutz. I can't tell. But there's an umbalula. Yeah, another umbalula. Are we looking at it? No, we can tell what it is from here. Okay. Oh, but there's a star next to it. Maybe we should look at that. Yeah, let's okay. look at the star. You want to turn the lasers back on? Right? Lasers coming back on. Can you put the lasers on the starfish like eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you make a smile with the telestrator. <laughs> and <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's 
simple choice. Uh, We're getting uh, things in twos today. Shark and Dumbo, Star and, there you go. Maybe, yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Oh. Is that good enough on still the Umbalula? Yeah. Um, I just want to oh. take a still cam shot real quick. Okay. I don't have the view up here. Do you also need the view of the laser camera? Maybe when we're on something. Dave, are you able to? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Well, I don't think we have to do it now, but... Uh, well, we could get rid of wire cam. That's not very useful for me, so if we could put... Still cam up in place of wire cam. Okay. We need challenge. Windshield wiper on that one. Oh, that's on the inside, isn't it? Sorry. Are you getting the umbalula? I got it. Thank you. I think that's a goniaster, the sea star. Noted. BRB. Okay. Ships are four. Oh yeah. I'm Have taking a good off interaction too. Home. Good luck. After the Dumbo octopus, I have really high standards for this dive. <laughs> I know, some of my favorite sea pens, a sea star, a shark, Dumbo octopus. It's a good dive so far. Right. Great dive. Jules, can you make the still cam screen as large as possible? Yep. Thank you. There we go. Oh, a fish. <laughs> Very make it fast as fish, fish as possible. Is this good? That's so great. Are Thank we you. flying okay. at, uh, at laser optimized height or see the bottom optimized height? Until we get to rocks, I think you can fly at whatever height you want to. Okay. You can either do the upper meter one or even the deck camera. I'm fine with either. I think ideally we keep deck cam just for situational okay. awareness. Then upper meter? Is this or do you, you can replace lower Looks meter and like I can uh, take a look day. there. Yeah, I should be able to see fine. Or an anemone. Can we zoom in, Dave? Sorry. Can't tell from here. Video overload. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like a tube anemone. Okay, cool. Bridge now. We can add another uh, five zero meters to two six five at zero point three knots. Pablo, is there anything that you're especially interested in while we're down here, or is everything of interest? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the truth is somewhat in between. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah. So we. we uh, we're looking for the minerals in uh, in the hopefully the big rocks, right? The the manganese loaded um, uh, crust. So until we get there, hopefully we get there. Um, uh, what we'll do is, if we find uh, a coral or a hydroid or some like special feature here, we'll uh -huh. we'll holler and and 
hopefully you guys can take us there and spend a few minutes just doing that. Otherwise, yeah. like Kevin okay. said, we'll you know we'll we'll continue uh, collecting data as we traverse in real time, uh, and if we find something exciting, we'll we'll we'll, we'll be excited about it, and we'll you'll hear <laughs> you'll hear from us. <laughs> okay, awesome. It looks like we have another Amvalula and a fish. What kind of fish is this? It looks... Oh, hey, what's that? Something cool and floating. Um, Zoom in, Dave. Cows or? Cows? Yeah, it looks a little too skinny to be a cuskiel. <laughs> There's a shark in the Herc uh, aft cam. Gone now. Yeah, Halosaur. Got it. this? Holothurian, maybe? This first half hour of this dive is like the greatest hits. <laughs> <laughs> Can we zoom? Yeah, let me get closer for okay. you. Okay. What is this one called? The okay, headless chicken? Headless <laughs> Holothurian? like that one. Haven't we seen one of these before? Yeah, we've seen a few of these. They're really neat. And this is a uh, SPL hosting no price covering for Amy as she's doing interaction. And uh, here we are witnessing another spectacular sea creature. See all of its insides there. Looks like it has some other animals on its Ooh, yeah. ventral side. Maybe they're parasites. So those are parasites and associates? Potentially. No. They're like little krill or something. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah. It looks like they might just be along for the ride. Yeah, I haven't seen that before. Yeah. Huh. These look like little spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Shuttling through the water. So bizarre. This is a great shot. Ooh. They really are like little deep sea aliens. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, the krill are moving around. They do kind of look like they're just there for the ride, not huh. attached. It's very interesting. What do we call this? A common solution relationship? That is not some symbiotic. Yeah, right. One is yep. completely unaffected, the other's benefiting. Oh, some on the back too. Yeah, I feel like that's likely. Hey. Wow, what a dive already. Another two on Balula. Three. <laughs> Three, <laughs> no, what I'm thinking. Okay. Kind of move over. Track, yeah. yeah. This move will run out in about 10 meters. Let's catch up. OK. 
Okay, we gotta find some rocks. How about an urchin? Urchin. Uh, urchin, yeah. Similar shape, not the right, <laughs> the right type of object. <laughs> Zoom in, Dave. I think we've seen a few of these. Oh, you can see the little star that's sitting right on top of it. Yeah. That's a big way that we know that these are echinoderms, correct? They have similar five-star radial body plan. Yep, echinoderms. Little bristle worm maybe living there. Ooh. Or a polychaete living on the side of it. So sand dollars, are they related to sea urchins at all? They sure are. Yep. Yeah. They're also echinoids. Nice. Kind of a compressed, flattened version of an urchin. Yeah, it's like exactly. a pancake version of an urchin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now what's this associate that's right on there? Um, It looks like maybe a polychaete. That's my best guess. So some type of worm. Okay, move it on. Uh huh. Um, this looks like Tromica soma. No, it is. Thank you. Another halosaur. Yeah. And maybe a tripod Ooh. fish. Or a halosaur hanging out near the bottom. It's amazing how much life there is here without any rock features. Yeah. Are we going to encounter some rocks? Yeah, that's that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're currently the waypoints have us kind of going along um, this kind of flat section here, and then okay. heading up slope when we get to waypoint two. But we could start climbing earlier if that's of interest as well. That would be exciting, if possible. Sure, we could. Um, do you have an eye on high pack? Great. We could kind of bypass waypoint two and just head up to waypoint three. That sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. Sorry about your waypoint. <laughs> um, were there any other science goals that uh, may have needed this the shallow bottom? Um, push this, course, uh, flat bottom. Push cores are really all I can think of. Okay. Wouldn't be a bad time to take some. Um, We might do a blank eDNA. Okay. You want to do that now? Yeah, yeah. If we could do a okay. push core and stop? a blank eDNA, yep. that would be great. Ship has stopped. Okay. It's a good time. Looks like they're changing heading, but that won't affect us. We tried it a couple times, it was grounded. Yeah. yeah. Tilt is also green, having a, a heyday. Yes, tilt for the Atlantic Cam is also having its own heyday. <laughs> <laughs> Not possible. Yeah, so in particular, 
Um, we're looking for ferromanganese nodules, um, characteristic species, and any new species or um, associates. EDNA, of course, try to and sediment cores. Try to when we first got down, try to again a little bit later. So we'll take our blank EDNA sample right now, and then you want me to hit it again? Um, we'll look uh, for an area yeah. of high I'll show you. Um, diversity. We'll look for an area with a lot of organisms, and we'll take another there. You see it? You want it left on or? Okay. This will be sample 176. 176, thank you. So a uh, little little story here from the from the laser team. Uh, so as we're traversing here and and science is getting uh, samples for future DNA analysis in the lab, uh, so we've been collecting uh, data uh, along the way. And like I said earlier, uh, uh, most of the things we see in the sediment and the sand here is, of course, quartz. Okay. Yeah. In particular, we're looking at microcrystalline quartz, uh, which is Get the type of uh, silicate and uh, mineral that makes up beach sand, so no surprise there. But uh, on occasion, uh, when we hit these black uh, spots that you can see uh, in some of the some of the uh, uh, frames of the of the videos, uh, those are uh, typically made up of uh, of some organic uh, matter that is rained down, it's coming down from the surface, and uh, but not all organic matter is created equal, the obviously. There are different chemical compounds that make up that matter. Um, in particular, there's one of them that uh, that we are fine-tuned uh, or optimized to measure, and it's called beta-carotene. Uh, and carotene uh, has typically a orange or red color. Uh, you know, uh, that's where the name carrot uh, comes from. <laughs> in fact, uh, that color. So carotene is the pigment uh, that uh, a lot of uh, life forms um, on Earth and maybe Hello. elsewhere, if there are any. Uh, uh, this is a pigment that uh, yeah, this that is no good, a man. type of sunblock, <laughs> uh, if you want. It's a, well, it's a compound that, uh, that protects uh, organic matter from the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So like we use you know, this uh, synthetic uh, or mineral uh, uh, sunblock uh, when you're out in the, in the sun. Life has built these natural pigments, uh, carotenes in particular, to protect from the ultraviolet from the sun. So what happens is that uh, even after this matter, uh, organic matter dies or, or, or decays in, in activity, it still preserves the pigments. And uh, this is what we're seeing in, uh, in some of the, exactly. So now Dave is showing, is showing our screen here. And, um, and I think hopefully you can see my cursor here. Uh, Go ahead, Data. Yeah, you can see it. So, uh, so typically we see these features uh, happening at about in this scale here. Uh, about 1,200 uh, units uh, in our scale and 1,500 units uh, in our scale. So uh, we're keeping an eye on those two because this is a way for us to to really see very clearly that we have uh, this pigment. Therefore, we have organic matter, and we can quantify that. So uh, one of the uh, experiments we're doing is uh, we are collecting data nonstop uh, in real time. So you'll see our screen uh, changing Pablo, on, on occasion. Uh, Pablo, sorry. Uh, yeah. Science, did we want to get a push core here as well? Yes, please. Okay. Oh. Catch all that. So, would we, would we, uh, yeah, always interrupt me if there's something more important to say? Uh, don't be shy. Uh, and uh, so, so, what we're seeing is, and you know, you'll see in about 30 seconds, um, you're gonna see in channel three the screen uh, refreshing and it's gonna be updating and it's gonna be showing uh, the latest uh, data point that we're getting. Actually, real quick, can we zoom on this, please? Might be Man nothing, Dave. but it might also be the C pen we've been looking for. Is that the one you're looking for? Uh, yes. <laughs> this oh. time is getting too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if we could sample that. Wow. Oh, Happy World Oceans Day. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is the sea pit. That this is really together. exciting. Yeah. All right. Zoom out. Finally. Wow. We've been looking for this for how many it's weeks? Like, yeah, <laughs> it wow. could be sediment. Is this the one that Steve wanted? Uh, yes. Okay. I believe it is. Um, Coco Blemnon. Wow. And are we looking for a snip or the whole sea pen? I think the last whole thing. Yeah, last time. Oh, sea pen. Wait. Could it be a, sl a snip and slurp? Uh, with sea pens, we it, it tends to be easier to to take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if we try to snip it, it it just it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. S such is life sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, I think we measured some of that, uh, some of these or, or similar uh, formations in the past, and uh, we find that uh, you know it's very hard to to hover in place with. Uh, with the uh, ROV, uh, as the pilots can can uh, explain to you. Uh, so uh, what we found with our instrument is that uh, features that are kind of like the size of a soccer ball or a basketball, uh, those are fine to, to hover see. over and stay there. Uh, things that are smaller, we call them as we can, uh, opportunistic. Is this so a slurp? We should, we should uh, hold. Oh. Uh, I mean, we it's just a straight slurp, slurp, right? We don't want to grab it if we can just slurp it. Yeah, let's try to It'll slurp. Uh, Jules, do we have an idea on the sea pen? Um, I think it could be Kofo Blumnon. Okay, possible. Copy. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Thank you. So if you don't mind me asking, if you're not too busy, what was that new ring that you were pulling on with the arm? What is it? Yeah. It's just a retaining ring. Just holds the slurp from bouncing around. Ah, fair enough. It was getting loose on us, so. The bungee cord goes through it, so that ring is just easier for the claw to it grab just, onto. Yeah, it just makes yeah. it easy to grab. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just little fixes like that go a long way. Yeah. Let me know when you're ready for suction. Let me get lined up and zoom in. Yep. And are we on the jar? We are on jar one. Okay. You ready? Give it the beans. Give it the <laughs> beans. We are at 30%, 40, 50, 50. Hang on, let me kind of excavate here. 50% <laughs> beans. Oh boy. Gotta get the peduncle. We got the what? You gotta get the peduncle. Yeah. Uh, slurp jar number one has a fine mesh filter. Would that affect? Oh, whoops. <laughs> what do you want? Uh -oh. it on? Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> that was a bad idea then. Which slurp jar do you want? Oh, uh, we have all the slurp jars available. Uh, one and two have the fine mesh. Everything else is fine. Okay. Stand by. Go. Can you flush the hose? Yeah, you gotta yeah. put it on yeah. flush and yeah. you gotta get <laughs> quit sucking while you're. Oh, well, stand by. Too many things going on? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like putting a dirt sample in every jar. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> that wasn't the idea. <laughs> well, it only goes in one direction, unfortunately. You can turn off the slurp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Okay. Ooh, what's in there? Oh. Dirt clods. Nice. Okay. You ready for me to go ahead and rotate? Uh, yeah. Kay. Well, did you turn it off? Slurp is off. It? Okay. Yep. <laughs> More of a dusting than a sample. Yeah. 
Okay. Yep. Number three. Uh, yeah. Okay. Turning slurp on to fifty percent. Slurp at fifty. Oh, <laughs> it goes deeper. Right. It's almost like weeding out the weed. So but this is one that we want. Come on, peduncle. Where's the wow. peduncle? It's really. Uh... Oh, there we, oh. Go. There we go. Woo! Hole in one. Thanks for coming with us, you pen. We've been looking for you for a long time. <laughs> Oh, it's in there. Okay. Yeah. So going off. There it is. Okay. Perfect. And rotating jar. It's a nice sediment sample too. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This will mean a f make a fine addition to our collection. That's one seven seven. Yep, one seven seven. Okay. Push core. Push core. Same site is okay? Oh. I think so, yes. Great. Dang it. <laughs> There's an autopilot mowing here. You ready for, uh, let me know when you're ready for sample salva. Okay. This would be sample one, seven, right, eight. Sample one, salva. Seven, eight. Let me know when you're ready for sample tray. Yeah, go for it. Sample tray coming out. Oh, cool. You've got a little uh, Whoops. Dang it. dust devil there. Ah. Is that coming from the thrusters? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty common. It happens a lot. Two. Several tray going in. Right. <coughs> Are we doing it out front or back here? Uh, science Both step down. Oh, cool. Oh. You sample tray out. Okay. That's fell out pretty much. We, yeah. That didn't work out very good. Sample tray going back in.
then ship it back home and get a whole team of people spend weeks analyzing the rocks, right? So right. the idea is if we could uh, help them by getting more data in here, so they will have to do less work back home so they can use their time more effectively, more efficiently, that would be a win-win for everybody. So that's really the, the reason why we think space tech now can really unlock a new a new way, really, to explore the oceans. So that's why we're so excited here. That's why we I can't, I can't keep talking. So, Kevin, <laughs> shut me off, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a quick question. So with this instrument currently can go to 1,500 meters depth in our ocean. What depth would that be on, say, Enceladus? Because I know that the, you know, the, the, kind of gravitational forces there are are less but the ocean is really deep so does this get you to does this pressure rating get you to like 5,000 meters in that ocean and that's a tough one to get off the top of your head yeah but, uh, no, no I'll give you a order of scale uh, it will get us less depth uh, here because you have to count the weight and the mass of the ice on top of you as well ah. so you know, given that we don't even know how thick that ice is, uh, right. estimates go between one mile or one and a half kilometers to 100 miles. Uh, so uh, one, uh, 150 kilometers. Uh, we don't really know, Adam. Um, I think that's uh, an engineering problem that we need to wait a little bit till the science is a bit more conclusive as to how do we have to build this to sustain that pressure. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, that's why we haven't done it yet. Uh, in fact, we have haven't even landed on on these icy worlds uh, and the challenge is not going to be to go in the ocean and drop a vehicle right and explore first challenge is a landing on a very small um, a planet uh, with very little gravity so you know that really requires a little bit of skill and then uh, you have to melt and drill through the ice right so you have to make your way down and if you remember how long it took to reach Lake Vostok on in Antarctica here, which mm -hmm. is what 4,000 meters, uh, something like that. Yeah. It took about three decades to do that. Uh, it's really hard to drill in in ice. Ice, when it's cold, is like rock. And yes, wow. we do have technology to uh, to uh, to drill. Uh, you know, deep. You know, ask oil and gas experts uh, how to do that. The problem is that uh, scientific drill holes uh, need to be clean. So. Uh, any mission on Europa we're looking for life is going to have to be clean. You don't want to bring life from Earth and or mess life up as you use fluids to really help your way down. So is this uh, a non-invasive or minimally invasive way to drill that preserves any life that is there that needs to be taken into account, which puts a lot of constraints in how to drill. So uh, not to mention that, you know, ice doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily static. And, and when it gets under high pressure, it can flow pretty easily. So as you drill a hole, does that hole start moving away from you as, you know, oh. where you are on the top? It's, that's super complicated. Oh, it does. In fact, in, it, you can see in, uh, if you look at high resolution images of Europa and even Enceladus, you see terrains that we call it chaos uh, terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that is, is essentially a giant flake of ice flipped upside down. Oh. So the, wow. the ice tectonics are so strong that it breaks out chunks and they're like massive icebergs and they flip. So you see the bottom oh. of that iceberg exposed there. So which oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew yeah. about chaos terrain from like a decade ago or something, but I didn't know there was a explanation for yep. it. That's yeah, cool. that's one of the explanations. Yeah, so uh, it's really exciting. You know, helps a uh, two things, right? So exposes uh, the interface ice water, which is where we think life likes to be, mm. based on what we see on in Antarctica ice sheets in Greenland. It really exposes that to to the outside. So even with a lander, you know, you can land on one of those, and you can get information about about that uh, that interface. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So you know, as you you know, you're getting now a little bit distracted from water to ice, but it really, I mean, it's ice water. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's another another of the challenges in space is that uh, it's very cold, right? So and as you go far away from the sun, you're talking now that you know even solar panels on Jupiter moons or Saturn moons. I'm not going to cut it. You need to start bringing uh, nuclear uh, uh, power supplies uh, or radioactive isotope generators, as the DOE of Na and NASA likes to call them. Uh, <laughs> essentially, they're still nuclear uh, batteries in the fact that they have a lot of energy packed, right? And they last forever, uh, or at least long enough for the mission. So, so that's another technology that 
still in development. So I think the convergence of all of this, you know, our part is very small, right? If you, if you, if you, if you get the threat, right? So, so all the stuff that needs to happen before we even reach the water and can release our vehicle there, uh, it's going to take decades to, to get there. So if you're young, uh, I encourage you to, and you like this exploration, I think you're going to be at the prime of your career, say within 20, 30 years, when we start landing on these icy moons and start doing oceanography in other planets. I mean, think about it. Oceanography in other planets. Uh, that sounds to me pretty, pretty sexy. Uh, uh, <laughs> that sounds very exciting. <laughs> career. But the, you know, the great thing is that we can use the technology right now for our own oceans. Right. You know, I think it's like kind of, you know, the best of both worlds. So. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we do have a few questions. Um, Adam answered one of them. Um, how far does the laser go in the water? About 1,500. Um, but so regarding the technology being tested, um, does it have any connection to future mining of the ocean? I'll um, take that one. Yeah, yeah Adam, that's for you. Yeah. So, you know, for decades, people have talked about uh, mining in the ocean because the, a lot of the stuff we're seeing down here, the iron manganese crust, uh, concentrates these rare metals that are in, you know, kind of low concentration in ocean water, but over time get highly concentrated in these uh, iron manganese crusts or iron manganese nodules. Um, these are the types of metals we need for the kind of future green economy, for building solar panels and, and batteries and the like. Um, the area that we're in is is pretty unlikely to ever be subject to to mining because of the you know the crust is kind of hard to get it's attached to the to the seamount um, but you know as scientists our our job is to collect as much information as possible it's not just what minerals are on the seafloor but what ecosystems and organisms are using those um, because we have you know, a real opportunity, uh, unlike in past human history, to think very carefully about the implications of, of extraction before we even begin. And so I think that's a pretty fortunate position to be in, and we're happy to provide as much information as we can so that we can make the best decisions possible to mine or to not mine or to mine sustainably or, you know, whatever it is. But, uh, you know, part of the work out here is to understand where those uh, metal resources are and how they're associated with the different ecosystems down here. And I, I will add, Adam, to that, that uh, all of this effort that Adam is describing, it is also going to help space uh, because the moon, uh, believe it or not, and if you, f if you follow NASA, NASA news, you know that uh, Artemis is the, the next wave of missions after Apollo. Artemis, sister of Apollo. Uh, uh, Apollo is the first time humans landed, uh, and the only time really over the course of a few missions on the moon. Artemis is the next generation of, uh, of human uh, exploration of the moon that is going to start uh, uh, industrializing the moon in the sense of, uh, of mining uh, resources on the moon that we need to, to do many things. Uh, one of them is to build rockets on the moon. Uh, we have all the metals on the moon rocks to extract and to build rockets there and even to build fuel, uh, hydrogen of course, there's a lot of water on the moon. So uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, you see these rockets, you know, and you see uh, Starship now and Saturn V, all the massive rockets on Earth. Why are they so big? Well, most of it, al almost all of it is just fuel tanks. It's all the fuel you need to burn to escape the gravity of Earth and launch into space. Uh, the moon uh, it's has about what 15 percent the gravity of uh, of earth is one feet one sixth of the gravity it's much easier you could jump 100 meters up in the sky on the moon so uh, for the same token you can launch rockets way 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 easier with much less fuel and the co-benefit of not having to burn methane uh, or other noxious gases that we do when we do launching from earth so if we could move all of our rocketry to the moon uh, over the decades of course and and develop that that's one way that, that NASA is going to, and other private companies, of course, are going to start moving to the moon. You can also build solar panels on the moon to not only power your operations, also to beam 
that's our power back to Earth, right? So another way to reduce uh, reliance on fossil fuels on Earth to to have en energy. And uh, but overall, I think all of that's going to start with uh, new mining technologies that we're going to have to develop for the moon. And I think uh, where and when that is done responsibly on Earth, uh, that is going to be very very informative, very useful, very important to transfer that to the to to, to the moon. Uh, mineral development uh, operations. So that's another connection now you want, right? The round trip connection from Earth to space, back to Earth, back to space. I think we're seeing a lot of now synergies and transfer of, uh, of uh, know-how and ideas from, from one to the other. So that's another reason to be excited about this potential of uh, responsible, uh, sustainable deep sea uh, mineral uh, discovery and, and development, um, if we can do it. Um, thank you. So, um, I, will, I am curious, so what's the plan after the cruise? Like, I know, um, will the laser dive bot continuously be um, tested on? Yes. So, um, so in fact, uh, very happy to, to announce that, uh, that we have secured uh, our next mission uh, with this technology. Uh, given the success of this uh, of this test over the last few weeks, um, uh, the government has uh, has uh, approved uh, next year's uh, deployment of uh, of the same instrument that you see here uh, on a different setting, uh, still deep sea, uh, but it, we're going to be looking instead of all volcanoes like uh, like Adam described here, we're going to be looking to active chimneys. Do you remember oh, the chimneys wow. that I talked about uh, half an hour ago? Maybe um, the ones that we think life started on. That's really, really the, the next uh, frontier for us. And, uh, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why NASA invested in this is because NASA wants to understand origin of life on Earth, how to look for them, and eventually how to do the same thing in other planets, right? So we've already talked about that. So, so I think uh, what we're really expecting for this uh, instrument in particular is that it will become a facility for, for scientists, right? So we're, you know, either via the National Science Foundation, uh, via NOAA, or even NASA, or a combination of all of that, this platform becomes available to scientists all over the world uh, to to advance and to explore uh, different deep sea settings. Uh, this instrument is maxed at uh, 1,500 meters, almost one mile deep uh, by design. Uh, we build it that way because uh, when we told NASA that this is what we thought NASA wanted, and with the money that we need to build it, uh, and NASA said, well, you know, uh, for the first te test, let's just not spend the money on, on building something crazy to go too deep. Let's build it something to, with something shallow, okay. but it's good enough for us. And these are the chimneys that I mentioned before, uh, in particular the chimneys uh, off the coast of Oregon in Juan de Fuca. Uh, these are about 1,200 meters deep. Uh, so for us was, you know, sure, it's good enough, right? So we're going to do it there. So this, this instrument physically, uh, it will hopefully be a facility for shallow or not so deep ocean, right? Cap at 1,500 meters. We are currently and uh, concurrently uh, building now a version two of this, which is going to be rated for 4,500 meters. Uh, so this triples down the, the depth that we can go with this. So we can explore um, uh, more of the depths of, uh, of areas like here uh, near the monument but also other potential areas around the world. So, uh, so yeah, there is plans to, to continue expanding not just the depth ability, but also the capabilities of the technology. So, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, this is exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Pablo, for that wonderful and amazing explanation chat. If you have any questions, please send them in. Um, we will be happy to answer them for you. We also, um, on the flip side, we have a question um, for our sampling in regards to the unidentified skull um, that was taken from our previous dive. Um, did we identify it? Um, any updates on the fossils and bones collected is the question. Oh, that's a good question. So um, as the chat noted, we, <coughs> we found a number of fossil uh, beaked whale bones they're they're mainly the beak part of the beaked whale which is the kind wow. of densest part that uh, seems to stick around and over this expedition we've now found four of them uh, which kind of blows my mind you know you, um, but what that means is that you know because we've 
explored, I don't know, a millionth of this area, maybe, perhaps, um, that they must be really all over the place. Um, also, 